Hi, my name is Stephanie Joy Phillips. I'm the founder of World Childless Week and I want to say thank you for joining us for this webinar. The webinar is called, and I've written it down so I don't get it wrong, Prenatalism may be getting louder, but so are the childless. And I think that's really relevant and important because we're fed up not being seen, we're fed up not being heard, we're fed up being misrepresented. And for those of us who are confident to speak out or reach out in any way, shape or form, it's like, yeah, we're going to do it and we're going to do it proudly. We're going to do it because we're worthy of being seen and being heard. I'm joined by three amazing people today. We've got Annie, Jessica and Hilary. I'm going to go around each one of them separately at first, just so we can find out what it is they've done in the past or the present or have planned for the future and the way that they're actually raising awareness about their childlessness. So I'm going to jump straight in and say, Hilary, would you like to join me and share your story of what you have been doing so far, please? I'd love to. Hi, everybody. I'm Hilary Fennell. And what I did is a year ago, I made a radio documentary called Childless. And it was broadcast, uh, I think it was actually, so I started making it this time last year. And it was broadcast in January and it was just a game changer. Like I, I've never, I've made tons of documentaries and I've never got such um, response to this documentary as I got to the one on childlessness. So that's what I did. And the reason why I made it uh, was because I just, there was a point where I was sitting around a table with um, a number of people I didn't know. And I, it just struck me, they were all talking about their kids, but there was like four of us who weren't talking about our kids. There was about 10 people. It was in a very neutral space in an artist retreat. And I realized the other four people who were silent didn't have kids either. And that led us to actually start talking about it. And it was literally the first time I'd ever thought this was actually a thing. I thought it was just me. So you might want me to go into too, too much detail now, Stephanie, because I know you want to go around to the others. But that uh, that inspired me really to make, to do something about it. It took a while between that incident and the making of the documentary because I didn't really want to do it. You know, I didn't want to. Um, I kept thinking I was going to something miracle was going to happen and I wouldn't be childless. So it, it was also my own journey making it was quite hard it was very hard to find women I, I just had time to do I didn't do men I just did women this time but to find people to contribute because a lot of people did not want to be seen to be childless or to be it's just such a taboo so that's what I did I made a radio documentary about it it's being broadcast again because it's childless week so it's on tomorrow it's on on News Talk, which is an Irish station, but you can get it globally. And it's also on my website on the Hillary Fennell and it's free of charge and you can listen to it. So that's my contribution. That's what I've done. And it's had a huge impact. And I'm planning to make a television, a film documentary on the same subject. I think it's brilliant. Like you say, it's so hard to take that first step. But when you do and you suddenly get the feedback because everybody else is yeah. saying, oh, my God, I'm not alone. Absolutely. Yeah. And I felt that way when I met Jodie Day, who some of you might know, who's in my documentary, because she lives, she actually lives in Ireland, but um, I'd never heard about disenfranchised grief, disenfranchised grief. I just thought I was a bit mad, you know, that I was so upset about this because I'd never really spoken to anybody about it because once I tried to speak to it, I got shut down by everybody. Oh, why don't you adopt? Why don't you try IVF? Why don't you, you know, so I just shut up for years. I just found it impossible to speak about. So it really is so taboo still, I find, to talk about being childless, not by choice. Um, so for me, it was quite a difficult thing to do because I didn't really want to have to confront, confront it for myself. But I'm really glad I did it. I'm really glad I've done it. And I've met such amazing people through doing it who've, who understand me. They understand, like you, you know, you understand what I'm talking about. It's not some whim, I'm not making it up. Because I always felt like people didn't really believe me you know that I was actually upset about this thing it's like, but you didn't have any how can you miss the thing that you don't have so that for me psychologically was really hard for me to get my head around it's having validation from other people though isn't it who actually go you know what you're not mad you're grieving you're like oh my god first of all I'm grieving what am I grieving what have I lost and we question it so if we struggle with the concept then it's not a surprise that everybody else does too but we struggle because you know, it's such an awkward thing to talk about that I think 
people who aren't in the position, they don't really try. I'm not trying to apportion blame, but it because and we kind of let them off the hook. Well, I did in the past because I was like, oh, I just, I just, we just want to talk about it. You know, it's too, it's too annoying as well when they kept saying, like even now, people would say to me, why don't you just try surrogacy or something? Like, uh, like I've just told you where, where I'm coming from. So it is, you know, people just want to find a solution, and I understand that, but that can be very hurtful. Yeah. Because you're trying to actually share with them your pain, you know, you just want to be acknowledged, isn't that it? You just want to be acknowledged and saying, that's a thing, like that must be really painful. And then you can move on. Yeah. But I think I was always felt I was being shut up or people kind of rolling their eyes or here she goes again, you know. I don't know if anybody else had that feeling, but that's what I had. Yeah, 100%, 100%, definitely. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And we will come back to some of the points that you've raised in there. I'm going to actually come to Annie next, please, if you wouldn't mind sharing what you're doing. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so, um, so I'm Annie Kirby um, uh, from um, Portsmouth on the sunny south coast of England. Um, and I have written a novel about childlessness. Um, it's called The Hollow Sea. Um, it's published quite recently. It's quite new in the world. She, can I show you? Shall I show you? Oh, it's, 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 um, pretty. It's, a, it's a beautiful cover. Show it for that reason alone. I'm very lucky to have a beautiful cover. Um, but um, one of the reasons I wanted to write it is because as a, a reader, um, I was looking for fiction about childlessness. Um, and in, in particular, I was interested in, in stories that were similar to mine. So no miracle babies um, and haven't gone mad or tried to steal a baby or any of those, um, any of those tropes that you tend to see represented in stories about women who are childless not by choice I haven't turned into a witch I haven't done any of those things and I really struggled to find fiction that represented my experience um so um so I wrote my own <laughs> um and it um you know there was uh, just so little out there and I, I mean I, I was I've been writing for years so writing is not a new thing to me but I'd never really tried to write about childlessness um and you know what well, it was quite a healing thing to do I had a lot to say that got onto the page it didn't all make it to the final draft um but I really wanted to do two things I suppose which was one for other childless not by choice people to to read the book and feel that I in some small way maybe represented a part of their journey obviously we all have kind of different journeys and histories and it's it's fiction it's not actually my journey either the characters in the book have have different history to to what I do um but so I wanted to to have that so that you know people from our community could read a book of fiction and and feel seen on the page but also I wanted to write a really compelling engaging story that would be of interest to people who have no interest in childlessness whatsoever but maybe by the end of the book I've kind of snuck in <laughs> some things for them to think about um, and just try to, to you know hopefully to make people a little bit more empathetic to how we feel and I have actually had um, messages from readers um, people who um, are mums who say to their shame that they've never even thought about what it might be like to want to be a mother and not be able to be a mother because they don't have any childless friends or they think they don't um so it's been and I've had you know messages as well from people from within the community who've read the book and obviously literature is very subjective I don't expect everybody to like the book because we all have a different taste but um I've been heartened by the, the feedback that I've had so far and that um people understood what I was trying to do with the story and have enjoyed reading it and didn't feel preached at which was a, a main aim for me that it would just be an enjoyable book to read um but you know hopefully maybe change a few hearts and minds along the way can I just jump in there saying I had the same thing the reaction to the the documentary um like a lot of people messaged me or it's you know we did a lot of social media around it and stuff but it was it was so interesting a lot of men got in contact as well and they said God, we never even thought this was a thing we just presumed and people who knew me we just thought you didn't want kids and then like you a lot of mums who just it had never crossed their mind and because they just don't know people in so 
yeah to raise awareness and get and they were really supportive and almost like embarrassed saying we never even thought of it so I think that's really important to raise awareness it's not just for our community it's it's general awareness um because a lot of it is just ignorance because we've been in the past it's been so taboo and people haven't talked about it so I'm really glad you you're getting the same response yeah it is and I think and I think it is really really important for us to kind of try and reach outside of our community um uh, you know to tell to you know to, to do stuff for each other but also to reach outside as well if we can definitely definitely and I love the fact that it's people just go oh that's a really pretty book cover that's a beautiful book cover I'll pick up oh I like the name of the title oh this sounds interesting read it and like you say get the message about actually realizing what the sort of learning <laughs> this sort of subconscious about childlessness as they go through the book and it's a really clever way of doing it and a subtle way of doing it that could really that create waves of compassion and a little bit of empathy and understanding and positivity towards thinking yeah there are different stories out there real or fiction and starting to actually associate the two together so I love that you brought this book out and are doing it this way Annie I think, it, I think it's brilliant <laughs> so Jessica Right, last but not no means least. Oh, hello. I think we'll sit back for 10 hours to hear what you've done, but would you like to do <laughs> yeah, <us? laughs> great. Um, I will try and be quick. Um, Sorry, mate. <laughs> uh, hello, everybody. I am in sunny London um, on this Saturday afternoon. Um, I'm Jessica Hepburn. I describe myself now um, as an author, arts producer, an adventure activist um, and the arts producer is the easiest thing to start with because for many many years um, I ran a theatre, a big theatre in London called the Lyric Hammersmith um, and uh, uh, while I was doing that I had this like secret life um, which was that you know I would say publicly I was this successful career woman and privately I was on this desperate mission to become a mother and I went through a total of 11 rounds of unsuccessful IVF and that became the subject of my first book different from Annie because I um, certainly to date um, have written narrative nonfiction. so I am the central narrator of the books that I've written. Um, my first book came out in 2014 which feels like a really long time ago and I'm really old now. Um, it was called The Pursuit of Motherhood um, and I just sort of described that as my misery memoir and um, sort of after that I mean like the reaction to it was absolutely phenomenal um, and I founded this festival arts festival called Fertility Fest which ended up being a sort of three-year project the last one was at the Barbican in 2019 Annie was saying earlier she came to that um, which was about bringing all sorts of artists together to discuss all aspects of making and not making babies in the modern world um, I then um, wrote uh, my second book which is called 21 Miles which sort of leads really neatly into uh, the adventure activism part of um, of my work now, um, which is really at the, very much at the forefront, um, which is that I, after I'd been through these 11 rounds of IVF, I decided I needed to do just something different with my life. I'd like lost this decade of life to what I describe as project baby. So uh, I decided I was going to swim the English Channel, which was nuts because I couldn't really swim. I was a head up breaststroker and I went on this massive journey and that became the subject of my second book and has started this adventure activism and um yes uh well i in may i uh, after a six year journey i mean all my journey seems to be quite a long time i finally managed to summit everest um which is uh the um i'm one of only two women that have ever swum the channel climbed ever and climbed everest um, and it's the subject of my third book, which is actually about music and mountains. And it's going to be the third and final book of me as the central narrator. And I, I feel like my journey in a way, I mean, like 
Annie and Hilary, I, I don't know how old you are, but I mean, I'm sure we've all been on this journey for a long time, but I definitely feel I'm sort of reaching um, a point where this final book will sort of be a conclusion of what I want to say. I, I mean, I think it will always be central to me and my work, but the sort of final part of that, but still, you know, this, this loss in my life is central to who I am. And, you know, I just finish with saying, you know, this morning I was writing and I, I, like I said, my book's about music and mountains and I was composing a playlist for the daughter I never had. Oh, that, that sounds really emotive mm -hmm. to do something like that, but beautiful as well. But I love that we're all doing things in different ways. Like mine's very obviously through World Childless Week and just putting my nose into conversations on social media now and again. Hilary, you're doing the radio and then possibly going to the film, which is sort of like almost I think people think, like, yeah, that's the way we do things. We go through doing, you know, social media platforms or um, TV, books and stuff. Annie and Jessica, you've got books, completely different styles. And then Jessica, you're swimming the channel and climbing <laughs> mountains, which is obviously to the extreme. But they all reach different audiences which is what's really important and they're not just contained into sort of saying only the childless will hear what we're talking about. No and absolutely Stephanie that's vital because mm. childlessness takes so many different forms and all our stories are very very different and we need all these voices because we don't just you know and I think we're going to come on to talk about some of the stereotypes but we, we don't just fit into one box you know. Mm. 100%. And I mean, I didn't just randomly make it. I'm a program maker. So I'm a journalist and a documentary maker and a factual television and radio, you know, content maker. But I had to think long and hard. Um, you know, did I want to put myself in it? You know, which was really interesting because I'm used to it was like poacher turned gamekeeper. Like my job is to interview people and get them. But I was like, oh, no, no, I have to do it. My, I have to put myself in it a little bit because I, I felt it was only fair. If I was asking these women to go on and talk about it, like I had to reveal something of myself. So it's not an author documentary. Please listen to it. It's fabulous. I mean, it's fabulous because of the women who are in it who tell their stories. So I want it to be really nuanced as well and it not to be a misery piece. So there is hope in it. But I was trying to be very realistic as well. So... I thought, well, that's that. And then part of me doesn't want to do something else, but the film, people are asking me. So, I mean, I'm I'm really, if it gets traction, I'll make a documentary, but it won't, again, it has to be, because that's what I do, it has to be a really good film that will be about this subject. But it's not just for us, it's for, it's for everyone. And I'd like it to have, a, I'm based in Ireland. So we have a national station like the BBC called RTE, but I'd almost like, well, everything is hopefully on the player eventually, but I want to have a global audience. So I've been talking to people in the States and stuff and looking at great initiatives in other countries. So it wouldn't be like an Irish centric piece. Um, so in a way, it's expanding what I'm doing in my professional capacity. But I mean, I don't want to be defined by this. Like I'm making another documentary at the moment and I lecture in in that's what I do in, in TV and in broadcasting. But I think it's interesting that, um, as Annie was saying, there's maybe, you know, you don't want to be, I kept on thinking, I don't want to be defined by this. I don't want to be defined by this professionally, but personally, it's never going to go away. You know, I've, I've come to realize this is, it's, it's never, I'm never going to wake up one day and not, you know, it's, I just have to learn to live with it. And that's been really hard because I kept thinking some magic was going to happen. And I think, the journey for me has been trying to really accept that, to accept it as a fact. And then the, 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 we're probably going to talk about this now. Then I had to unpack, well, why am I so upset and see how much of it was societies, what I picked up, what we're talking about now, the pronatalism, the pro birth society that we live in. And, you know, we all know that parenthood is not easy, that lots of people have children who are unwell or whatever we, we know it's not perfect but it's still this you know to see how much was me just wanting something that I couldn't have so there's a whole load of work that I had to do for myself and I'm really glad I have but I think part of me just thought it would all you know fix it and all it does doesn't it is make you just um 
do you know what I'm saying? It's just trying to accept it, isn't it? That it's it's just it's a fact. But once I'm talking about it to other people, it makes it real and it makes it it's it's livable with. But up until then, I had never talked about it to anybody until I made this documentary. So you can imagine my family going, what? <laughs> you know, it was just really hard because my brother and sister have children. And it's like their kids are like, you know, all grown up now. So, I mean, it, I felt funny, like, oh, God, I'm mad, like still thinking about babies. Like they had they definitely had their kids really young. So um, I found for me, it's just a subject that can go on and on and on. But I don't want to be defined by it. And I think that's fine. So I'd be interested to know, Annie, how you, you know, why you think this is the last book in the series that you're going to do about the subject. Jessica, you mean me? Yeah. Um, I think, well, I want to move on to other things, uh, definitely to write other things. Um, I think family will be a big theme. Um, and uh, living big and bravely, which is like what I try, like, you know, if I have a strap line that defines my life, it's like big and bravely when life doesn't go to plan. But sort of, you know, like I always say that that's like, that's everyone's life. Um, and this is my particular sadness um, and uh, that I'm having to live big and bravely in the face of uh, not having been able to have the children that I wanted but I, I just feel on like I mean <laughs> I know I would say that I know that Maya Angela wrote seven um a, a seven um books of autobiography um but I'm not Maya Angelo and I just sort of feel after three um that I've written what I want to write about this story in my life but what I am quite surprised about is how it is still central to this third book um so then I'm just going to make that that's why yeah if that makes sense it's just another step isn't it like you say it's like the first step is to sort of think okay I'm not going to meet the person or the IVF isn't going to work or my body has failed me I've got to admit this is the deadline that I don't want to step over saying I'm not going to be a parent and then it's dealing with all the grief and going, actually, I'm sort of like maybe moving forward a bit. And then it's like, can I drop it? Do I want to drop it? Is it going to be with me? But can it be just a small part of me rather than everything that I feel about me? And it's all these different stages. And that's obviously, Hillary, in a way, you're almost like at that first stage of like just sort of saying, hey, I'm speaking out. And Jessica, you're at the stage thinking, I don't want to do it anymore. Mm -hmm. within five years time like oh actually maybe I do but maybe I don't do you know what I mean in in Annie as well you with actually going with this book of yours it's in the hollow sea it's just going out there but it's going out in an undercover way almost do you know what I mean because it's not quite full in your face like some of the other things it's yeah yeah, yeah it is it is undercover and it's also um I I kind of really admire Jessica and and Hillary for for kind of like talking about their own stories in such a public way. Um, and although I have written kind of some short articles of narrative nonfiction about my journey, I, I really felt much more comfortable it fictionalizing um, and, and creating a character um, whose journey is different to mine. And, and for me, that was much easier to, to, to write about. It still, it all still felt like a bit too raw for me to write about certain aspects of my journey and maybe I will write about them one day but I definitely wasn't uh, ready to do that so I kind of I like you know I'm full of admiration for for Hillary and Jessica and being able to to do that um but yeah I think um I think the medium of fiction for me um was a, a good for me a good way for me to write but also a good way for me to try and get my message out there in a sneaky way <laughs> Yeah, but it's a good way because it's a different way. And that's what we need to do. Because like I was saying with World Childless Week, I'm very much still contained within the childless community, but we need to reach the parents. Yeah. Because it needs to be brought from the parents to understand so the children that they have come up understanding childless, child-free parent, yeah, it might be one of them. And it's not a question of oh, which one do I not talk about? Which one do I expect to be? Which one am I, I expected to be? Which one will I feel worthy of or not worthy? And all these like categories, it should just be one of the real conversations. So 
whatever way we break into parents and their market really that's what we need to do yeah. more than our own because hopefully fingers crossed most people with childless will find us in one way or another but parents don't until perhaps it comes to affect them through a very close relative or sometimes their own children this is what I've been struck with a number of people that have been in touch with me and said oh I've never thought about this before because I don't know any childless people and I'm thinking I bet you do mm. you just haven't realized that they're childless not by choice or you were friends with them at one point but you're not anymore because that friendship has drifted apart for all the complicated reasons that I'm sure we've all talked about in our different projects uh, so I've, I've found that like kind of quite fascinating feedback actually about just the complete lack of awareness among some people of our existence um, and it's not really their fault they haven't done anything wrong it's just that that we haven't been visible for so long um, you know and I'm I think even just over the last I think nine years since I since I realized it wasn't going to happen for me um I think the difference even just in the last maybe 10 years or so in terms of uh, in terms of our visibility is amazing um but there's still quite a long way to go definitely I think even in the last three to five years it's suddenly yeah. stepped up a bit but there's a lot more people talking yeah. out about it with the amount of people that even contact me they're like I, I'm a therapist or I've written a book or I'm doing this or I'm doing that and like you said, even when I started, it was like, no, it wasn't heard of because, and like you say, we can't blame people for not knowing about childlessness because it's not something we talk about because it's, if you want to be a parent, you assume you're going to be a parent. And when you're not, you go, oh, heck, I can't talk to anyone about it because like we say, we go back to being, I'm the only one. Yeah. So that's why, you know, for those of us who are courageous enough to do whatever it is we can to speak out about it, this fingers crossed that it's going to make that difference that as years go by it becomes less and less of a taboo subject and more of accepted and then normality yeah and that would be amazing yeah. normality would be amazing wouldn't it yeah. that it's just that we don't need to, to talk need, about it we yeah. don't need world child's week we don't need support groups because we can speak to anybody and everybody about it without feeling uncomfortable you know that's it's a dream and i hope and pray one day it will happen i don't know it's going to be overnight when well, we know it's not going to be overnight but, you know, it, it's starting. There's that sort of crest of the wave that's building now, which I don't think was there, like you say, 10 years plus yeah. ago, it didn't really exist. And I think, like we said, in a way, this can lead on to the fact that we were saying about the stereotypes and the articles that are out there at the moment are misguided. They don't give a true indication of who we are as childless men and women. The step parents are quite often childless and they're evil mm -hmm. or the woman who kidnaps the babies mm -hmm. is because she can't have her own children her own child died or saying uh, the two separately um, beforehand that the soap opera person who's been desperately trying to get pregnant doesn't I mean, in a few weeks or a few months she's happy going on life and a child is never mentioned again <laughs> because she's happy and you think well where are the real representations of somebody who hits these unexpected triggers all these things of when somebody, somebody becomes a grandparent and they forgot after they thought they were okay that friends were becoming grandparents, not just parents. And it's these true representations that we need. So I was wondering if there was an instance of any particular stories that stood out in your mind that really made you sort of like do that inward eye roll or grind your teeth because you just think, why are they doing this wrong? And one story came to my head, which I'm just going to share from a few years ago. I was actually watching Blind Date, a real classic TV show, Blind Date. It was a modern version. And I'm pretty sure that the questions that they get asked, they know about beforehand. They've got their pre-prepared answers. They're not just sitting there going, oh, I don't know what to say to that one. But a question was asked, and I was literally gobsmacked, jaw drop. Because the boy actually turned around and said to the girl, I want kids. What's your fertility like? Is your fertility good? And I just thought, how the hell have they accepted that question as being acceptable for primetime TV, early evening on a Saturday or something like that, to actually say to somebody, can you have kids? And of course, she was all jokey and laughy. And, and she was like, well, yeah, I'm sure I'm healthy and I can have kids. And I thought, but you don't know. You might look back on this a few years. And if you can't have kids, that could haunt you. 
and how many people are thinking that they're okay and they've just found out they're not yeah. and I remember I was angry and I was like oh, I can't believe this so I wrote to I think it was like BBC Channel 4 whatever it was and of course you get the standard oh we've taken on your complaint I thought I'm not having that so I wrote again and I didn't get anywhere and I didn't expect to get anywhere but I just needed to get my frustrations out in the hope that even maybe the one person who read that email said actually yeah that's a bit wrong perhaps I'll rethink things myself if it gets nowhere else maybe they think about it but to this day I'm I still can't believe that they were allowed to pose that question in a family tv show it, it really shocked me it's yeah. horrific actually asking that question yeah. honestly, I honestly I'm it's gobsmacked yeah that you were when you saw it now that you've just told us about it yeah okay yeah I couldn't I kept it like you know on, on my recorder thing until it was updated and disappeared because I thought I can't get rid of it because there must be something somebody somewhere must be able to you know what I mean so it was like see how poor and how bad that was to actually have that and stuff but so yeah is there anything that you've had similar or even a newspaper article where they've actually changed things and misrepresented us that comes to mind um, well, I was thinking about this. So <laughs> before, when you told us you were going to ask this question, I was like writing loads of things down. I mean, I remember I was very shocked. Um, uh, I th we're, well, three of us are in, in the UK. Um, I was very shocked um, when there was a Conservative Party or Prime Minister election. And I, d I don't know if you remember the days when Andrea Leadsom, who's sort of slightly disappeared now, was in was um, in the running against Theresa May, who didn't have children. Um, and Andrea Leadsom got away with saying that she didn't, she thought that Theresa May shouldn't become prime minister because um, she didn't have she didn't have children and therefore she didn't have an investment in the future of Britain. Um, I mean that was like sort of off the scale shocking for me, um, particularly as many of the women um, who are running the world much better. The men um, do not have children. Um, so that, that was a sort of one from the political spectrum. I mean, obviously, literature is littered with stereotypes. Um, just, I mean, like I could I could reel off a whole load, but um, I was what a friend of mine um, at the end of last year told me to, I mean, you know, like I'm like anyone, I love a bit of a thriller every now and again. And she told me to watch The Secret She Keeps, which is on the BBC. Um, in fact, they just released a second series. And I start I started to watch that and it was great. And I did watch it all, but it was definitely the, you know, the the it was the whole thriller was bound around a woman who was stealing, you know, like insane because she couldn't conceive or she'd lost a baby and she was um stealing another baby. Um, and and actually I've seen that the second series has just come up and I, I can't watch it because of that I just can't go there I like once I did it but and it was fine but I can't go there again but even though I don't know what it's about um and I think the final thing that I would say it just sort of riffing really off what you the point that you made I mean like I do always say that <laughs> Like these stereotypes and these crass comments or questions like in Blind Date, you know, like they go back centuries, you know, like, they, it, it, you know, it starts from, you know, so long ago that it's in a way we, we have to forgive people. I, I just think we have to go in into the world thinking that like, you know, people will say the wrong thing around this, like there's we yes we've made huge strides in the last decade but like there is work to do beyond our lifetimes you know and the only way that we can change things is to stand up and you know and and speak you know um and i have to say from my own personal experience like i was before i wrote i mean what's ridiculous is like I, I, actually can i just say um hillary when you were giving your um intro at the beginning and you said 
I thought it was so interesting because you talked about your contribution to childlessness being the um, documentary that you've created. And I've read your CV, Hilary. I mean, you've done so many amazing things. Um, and I thought, oh, well, tell us all about those, you know, because, um, but I do sometimes feel like this has become my whole identity. It is my, my life is my work. My work is my life. But um, I also feel that coming out about my infertility and childlessness is what transformed my life um, and took away a lot of the secrecy and shame. Um, and actually I have had in my own life, and this is sort of a positive point to finish, like nothing but positivity from mothers and family and strangers and in a professional context. And I think that is because I now come to it from a place of like without shame, like this is part of me, but it is not all of me, you know, it is not, not all of me. And, and actually people don't necessarily make crass comments to me, or if they do, like we go, oh yeah, that was a clanger, you know, like it's okay, you know, because we've got to find a language together. So I suppose, yeah. I know that's a bit like positive and happy, but I try to be. We're on a journey. It's getting better. No, I think that's really interesting. Uh, there's a couple of things. Yeah. And when I was making a documentary, somebody, a lovely woman who's in it, Amanda, she said that to me. Oh, I know what it was. So I was asking people to do it. Couldn't find anybody who'd agree to go on the documentary. It was so hard like to find people in in. Anyway, um, one person I spoke to, no, a couple of people, they said, oh, we don't, I, they said they wouldn't do it because they didn't want to be seen with the losers, you know, the losers as in to, so I had, that was just in my head. And, and I remember saying it to Amanda and she's saying, but if you come with it, with that energy that you're inferior, that's what people are going to pick up. If you own it and just say, look, this happened. I want to have children and I don't, and it's a sadness, but you know, it's kind of gets that out of the way. And that's really what I'm hoping to achieve. But I mean, recently I had a couple of funny, I mean, they're quite amusing things that happened um, around the stereotype stuff. So and a different radio station rang me and they said, oh, we listened to your radio, your documentary and it's fantastic. Would you like to come on our show and talk about this subject? They hadn't sent me any link, but they said there was a, an article in the uh, the Daily Mail today about how uh, childless people without children have so much more money. So it's called, you know, there was the pink pound and the grey pound and this is a something else pound. So will you come on and talk about that? Uh, and I said, did you listen to my documentary? And they said, yeah, 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 you're, it's great. Like, you know, you're child free and all the rest. And I said, I don't think you did. Well, I kind of put on the documentary, but I said, I'm not. Like, you want me to come on and say that I've got so much. I said, this is a, this is a complete myth. Like, think of, I could have spent all my money on counselling over the years or on, on fertility treatment. Just because I don't have children doesn't mean I've saved everything everything in a piggy bank that I would have. Like I say, I can't come on and talk about this. I said, I'll come on and talk about it. So anyway, didn't go on that show. Uh, but I thought that was funny. And the other one was, I'm on a WhatsApp group with uh, women I, I met through this uh, journey. And they, again, it was a UK paper. It could have been, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say the Daily Mail. It was some paper. and. Uh, it was how, did you see this one recently? How people without children shouldn't go on holiday in July and August because it's taking up space for people for, and we should we should take our holidays at, at different times. <laughs> and then I was going like, you're going, look, you know, whatever, why am I even upset? I just laugh, but I mean, that's just, and there's logic in it, but they just don't see how hurtful that is. And also it like, we might, like people who lecture or teach, like you have to, you take your holidays and holiday time. It's not just if you don't physically have your children. So that kind of thing. But I also did a uh, part of an MA I was doing was about finding tropes in film. So I looked at 30 different films, like mainstream films in uh, Ireland, the UK and America, say from The Hand That Rocks the Cradle to um, The Prime of Miss Jean Brodie, all of these. I mean, looking, I was looking for a, a positive representation of a female without children who wasn't mad, bad, crazed, who steals a baby. or and, and there was none. There was none because they were never happy. If they were married and didn't have children, it was still there was no happy representation I could find in mainstream, mainstream cinema last year. So um, and then you could say, well, sex in the city. But even that, 
Look, I know we're going off on a different tangent, but it's really interesting if you start to look at Prime Suspect that was told to me. OK, fair enough. But I was looking at film. Um, so when you try to actually look for those positive representations of just a happy person who doesn't have children and it maybe is married, like they're not necessarily single and, you know, unhappy or, what you know, not to be single is anything wrong with that. But it's always it, it was just really hard. So, I mean, I would be very much but I'm aware of it now. So. Um, so there are a couple of my my experiences, yeah. No, it's very true because, like you said, because it's always the portrayal that families is the happy way, the way the way you find the true love, the good in life. That's what you're expected to do. If you're childless, you must be. If you're not bad, you're miserable. So, as you say, articles in newspapers and magazines often give a negative slant to it when you're trying to say, actually, I'm happy with my life now. I'm okay with my life is now. I've got an amazing life and these wonderful friends or everything else, but they still put the next slant in the title or they put in pictures that are inappropriate. And it's a case, it's really hard to let them see that as child's people, we can be happy because it goes against what they think is the norm, I think. Do you know what I mean? So we're sort of fighting that battle, but it's a continual thing because we are entitled to be happy. You know what I mean? We're not all miserable or negative and just see us for who we are the truth of it yes there's grief but there's grief in lots of different areas and all the people who are grieving are not all childless it's not just grief and childless and nobody else and yeah it's getting that fine balance out there and trying to find a way to do it yeah there was um, a netflix show last year and i'm annoyed with myself because i can't remember the name of it but it was um it was a really good show about um this it's set in the USA where this man was kidnapped and it was about kind of the police and his family trying to figure out what happened to him and get him back. And it, it was like eight episodes long. And suddenly in episode seven, all the focus moved to a minor character who was childless. And it turned out the whole thing was her fault because she was so unhappily childless that she had gone on the internet and done something really unkind and evil. And it was like, it was a plot twist. She was barely in it up until that point. And the whole, I found it so frustrating because it was un, it was unnecessary for the story that they were telling. And it was so lazy as well in the way that it was done. Um, and that it just, it just buys into that, that trope that you have to be sad or mad or bad if you're childless. And you can't just be ordinary um, or you can't be nuanced because, you know, we're all complicated people. And I think that's what, I have personally found frustrating about representations of childless, not by choice people in fiction and film. And I, I have this working theory that if you're a deserving childless person, then you will get a miracle child of some kind, whether it's supernatural or um, you've been having IVF and then you have one night stand and you get pregnant, you know, by your husband's best friend or, um, or, you know, just, just, by the supernatural um so I mean one of and I liked you know I, I read books about miracle babies when I still thought I was going to become a mum because I still hoped that I would get my magic like Hillary said I thought that the magic might still happen um so one of my favorite books and it's still one of my favorite books is The Snow Child by Yo and Ivy where the childless couple build a girl out of snow and she comes to life and I love I love that book and I will always love that book but I needed more or needed other books and not to, not for that to always be the answer but it also it also ties into what Jessica said so the snow child is based on a Russian folk tale about the snow maiden um, and there's also a Japanese folk story about the peach boy where the childless woman is washing clothes by the river peach floats down the river and inside is a baby um, and even even stories where you don't really think about it it's like Rapunzel for example we think of Rapunzel being in her tower with her long plait is that Rapunzel? Um, actually she was gifted to her childless parents by a witch um, so these these themes are there and they go back a long way um, so they're really um, they're really hard to break these stereotypes because they're so so old and and you know babies floating down rivers in um, in cradles and things like that so it's really it's really hard to change them and you know, I don't I don't actually think, you, you know, that we should never write about those issues, that, that it should never be the childless person that's bad, but it, it shouldn't always 
be that there should be balance like we have with anything else and any other kind of stories um and even I think I watched a show um, on Netflix called Sex Education, which is a fantastic show. And it's it's really, it's a woke show. And I use woke not in a pejorative sense, but in a way to say that it's really progressive and then it's really representative of um, different sexualities and different races and things like that. But the one childless person they have in that show who has unsuccessful IVF is the ho- most horrible person in the show. Um, and I found that, I found that particularly frustrating because the show is so good in so many other ways and how, you know, how they represent other marginalised groups. I found that really frustrating. And I don't know if that character will be back in the next series, but if she is, then I think it, it will go one of two ways. Either they will rehabilitate her and make her a nice character and she will get her miracle baby or she'll stay evil and childless. And that seems to be the way that it goes. Um, and we, you know, we all we all use tropes in storytelling. I think it's natural and we don't necessarily know that we're using them, but I think we have to keep shouting about it and making people aware. Mm. Yeah. Amy, uh, Sex Education is one of my favourite series, although I didn't think series three was as good as one and two. And I have totally blanked who that person is. So that is obviously, <laughs> I've obviously done a like, I will not. <laughs> Who is the character that you're talking about? I've totally it's blanked. It's the headmistress. Oh, yes. The school. Oh, sorry, head teacher, but the new head teacher of the school. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yes. But that's why the series three, that's why I obviously thought series three wasn't as good. Yeah. yeah. Because she's new in series three, isn't yes, she? Yes, new series three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. It's okay. <laughs> We've had a couple of questions appear, and I think this one's quite relevant first. Um, it says, I'm 60 and childless. In the past few years, I've taken on caregiving of my mother and disabled sister. It surprised me for the first time in my life, I experienced a certain kind of respect from women peers who are mothers. It felt like for the first time they accepted me as a worthy woman, whereas before I felt in some way excluded or considered less than in some way. As can you speak to the cultural expectation that woman's identity is primarily as caregiver? And I think that's very much like, again, related to your mother, you're a caregiver. And it is almost like the same, the representation of us as childless women is we don't care. We don't have empathy. We're hard nosed. We're career driven and everything else that goes along. So Anybody else like to answer that question or some aspect of it? I just say that that absolutely drives me nuts. I totally relate to that. Like, I I mean, I have nothing profound to say other than that, that I, I totally get that. And it actually really, really annoys me. It makes me angry. It makes me sad because some of it I kind of internalized. And I thought, like, I think I'm a really warm, caring person, <laughs> like, but uh, that it's like, you know, that phrase, you'll never know love until you've had your own baby, you know, like that kind of thing. Um, it's insulting. And to us as humans and, and women, men, whatever. I mean, it's just it's just so that for me was a big one that I had to 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 deal with because a bit of me kind of maybe believed it because it was so 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 deep um, in society that it's almost like you know it's so many other ways we care for people like I have an extended group of friends who I care for I've you know my family even though I don't have my own physical child you know so I think um just to say that I I, we we that's one thing I would really love to change and that's really why um because it's all interlinked isn't it then how are you going to feel happy in your head if you never had this love so it's all about your own well-being and and our own experience of whatever happiness is it's all it's all affected by this deeply held notion as you say in your peers if you don't have children they mightn't respect you until you are caring for somebody else and they see that you are able to care for somebody somebody other than yourself and I think it's linked up as well with the idea that we're very selfish because we didn't have children and again that to me seems to be because a lot of the time people presume that if you don't have children it's because you did not want to have children so it's this thing I don't want to make a division between the childless and the child free but I mean there is it, it is very different if you chose not to have children then, then that you wanted to have children and didn't 
And that to me is something that, I mean, look, it goes back to the patriarchy, doesn't it? And everything else about how women are perceived anyway, uh, whether you're child free, childless to have children, you are <laughs> perceived as mainly meant to be a caregiver. And that's something that we just um, obviously through feminism are trying to change. But I, it would be something that I'm so glad for the, um, I was going to say the caller, but the texture that, that, that they're now feeling, they're getting, you know, of course they're a caring person. Um, but that's my thoughts on it, yeah. I think the weird thing that you mentioned there, I'm just glad on this quickly, is when people say we're selfish, it makes me laugh. Because if you wanted kids and you were a parent, you got what you wanted. If you're child free and you didn't want kids and you are child free, you got what you wanted. As childless, not by choice, you didn't actually get what you wanted. So in their sort of logical sense of saying you're selfish, you go, well, no, we aren't. We're actually, <laughs> you, we didn't get what we want. Selfish is when you want something just for you. And we didn't get it. So how can we actually be selfish? It's a reverse. And I like to sort of like throw that one in now and again into conversations. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I think the selfishness thing, I mean, like I can't I can't even wrap my head around that because we don't like it seems to me that selfishness is having children because like we don't need any more children in the world, you know. Um, so I, I, th I love that question about um caring because I am actually the carer of my 90 year old mother and um and it's been really interesting um that because I do think that I felt whilst I totally feel worthy I do I do feel uh, um you know I felt for a long time that I wasn't like a proper woman because I couldn't conceive and I, I really don't feel that but I did I did have a part of me still that was like oh well maybe it's just as well you know that I'm not a mother because actually I'm sort of very driven to run arts organizations or write books or swim seas or climb mountains so that's that's you know like that that's really what I, you know all these sort of very quite masculine pursuit not that writing's a masculine pursuit at all but um or any of these things should be masculine pursuits but you know like I, I had some dialogue going on in my head around that so um caring for my mother helped me realize um that you know that I really did have these I, I was quite pleased to like really be able to have those responsibilities although I, you know again I sort of go well I've got the best of both worlds because she's not a child so I can leave her you know occasionally I mean you know even though she's 90 and I can go off and climb a mountain um or you know go adventuring somewhere so I sort of feel like oh this is you know I I suppose I always just try and look at the situation that I've got which is not the situation I chose and I'm never getting over it and it's always going to be a sadness but I just try and turn it to my advantage so I actually am quite happy to have had this opportunity to um, to care give. And, you know, like this, like just as a final note from me, really, it, like this week, I my my niece had was a teenage mum, you know, which in the UK is like not a good thing. You know, it's the biggest public health campaign ever to try and reduce teenage pregnancy and um and she had a daughter who is now 17 years old you know has had a really really rough ride in her life and her mum didn't take her to her university open day this week I had to take her um and we went off to Cambridge she's like I can't believe it she's amazing she wants to go to Cambridge University and I like I felt like okay I'm the auntie here I'm not the mother but my god I've got this amazing you know like I don't have to carry any of the weight of that I just got this amazing experience um being a sort of an alternative mother and I look out for those opportunities now I don't run away from them I I go bring on my alternative motherhood thank you One of the um, things that I tried to explore in my book was this idea of selfishness and and nurturing and how it, we're seen to be different in, in, and deficient in some way because we don't have children. Um, so I guess without giving away too many plot details, it was really important to me that um, one of the one of the childless characters does something spectacularly unselfish. In fact, twice she sacrifices herself for her ex-husband's new wife and child. 
um, and sacrifices her own happiness for them. And um, the other character, uh, there's two childless women in the novel, and the, the other childless women in the, in the novel, um, I wanted them both to be quite flawed. I didn't want them to be kind of stereotypical, the opposite of evil and be stereotypically good. I wanted them to be quite flawed and complicated characters. Um, so that so the one that, that makes the big sacrifices is, is kind of a, quite a selfish main character, but then ends up doing something really unselfish. And and the other the other character um, is quite an introspective and, and moody person, but also very empathetic and kind and supportive of her of her friends and family. She finds different ways to nurture, which ways that she she didn't expect, um, and that and that's where she kind of is by that the end of the book. Um, and I found that um, I, I guess it's something I gave a lot of thought to about whether I was playing into those stereotypes by giving her a different kind of nurturing role. Um, and and but it, but actually, I think in many ways we all nurture in some way. There's just so many different ways to nurture, um, and it, you know. Um, it, it's a constant frustration to me that people think that I'm not nurturing or that I don't know what it is to be selfless just because I don't have a child. Um, and it's, it's, I guess, just another part of the message that we need to get out there. And honestly, I think people sometimes need to think back to before they had their children, were they really that terrible and selfish? They probably weren't. Um, so I think, yeah, I just, I think, it, I, it's that's a, it's a difficult issue for me I think a different difficult question for me in terms of like that that sense of nurturing yourself I, I care for my mum as well um but I don't think I'm any more caring or nurturing now that I do that than I was 10 years ago when I wasn't doing that um so yeah sorry I feel like I'm rambling now but I just find that quite a difficult issue to to navigate but I did try to to deal with it in in my writing it's like if we didn't care why are we in communities and doing what we're doing yeah supporting each other <laughs> do you know what I mean you know, having that understanding and empathy of each other and it just shows that we do care we care more than the general populace who don't understand and don't necessarily some of them want to even take the time to understand because it's they just want to fix it and if they can't fix it they don't know how to address it We've had one other question come in though, We're running out of time nearly, but I'm going to pose this one to you because it's a good question. Do childish people represent a threat to other people, parents, because from their perspective, unconscious, it challenges the core of their own worth, self-esteem. So, you know, does that make sense? Do we need to own that we are an ultimate threat? I think that's quite interesting because we always say the grass is greener, and as you say, during like um, lockdown, it was a case of the childless are out there whining and dining in their own home with the champagne and the strawberries and enjoying life and sunbathing. When we know for some of us, it would be a reality, but for many of us, it wouldn't because we'd be upset and sad and locked away on our own or in a situation where we're expected to go in to cover for the parents who can't go in and such like. But there is that picture that we've got an easy life. I, don't, I, I, I would agree with that. I think we are in some sense. My the feedback I got was um, so with my the documentary I made, like I was looking for hope in it. You know, it's not a misery piece. But one of the things that struck me um, from talking to was a man I spoke to and he's not actually in the documentary, but he was amazing. And he was saying it's like if you don't have children and you've confronted it and you want to, you're you, you're you know, we all need a meaning in life, don't you? So it's almost like an existential crisis and you find the meaning in life in lots of other ways. Like there's lots of other things, but he was saying, so he was saying that if people have children, it kind of means they don't have to go there. It's like, oh no, I'm so busy. I've got my kids and this is my meaning. So I think we are a threat because we all know that sometimes parents are, they're not, they don't bond or care with their, as much as they should about their kids or maybe they're not good parents and maybe they didn't want to have the kids or maybe, so we are a threat because we, I think we're actually, we need to go there. We need to find meaning in life in, not through children, in some other way. And I, I think it does challenge people 
because they don't want to think about that. They don't want to think because he. Excuse, I have my. If I had a kid, I'd probably be saying, "I say I've done my job. I've got what else am I supposed to do? I'm fabulous. I've got my kid now. So, and that's going to be my legacy, or not a legacy, but you know, it's, you you. And because I don't have that, I had to really dig down and say, "Well, what am I for? What am I able to give? What am I able to contribute? Who am I? How can I find joy in other ways?" And that I think is the threat. And that's why they prefer just not to think, talk about it, think about it sometimes, because they have to challenge their own belief system and say, if they didn't have their children, what would their value be? What would their um, way of finding love be? Because in Ireland, the family is, you know, it's if you don't have kids, it's so unusual. The family is so important still. It's intrinsic to our society. So it's almost like half of the families don't even like each other. But that's not the point. They are families. They have so... I think it really challenges the norm and that's what's happening. And as hopefully in 10 years, it'll just be a thing. It's like where the LGBT community were 30 years ago in a few years, it'll be fine. People will just accept that we're exactly the same as them, but we just don't have children. But at the moment, I think it is challenging because they've got to look, look at, look at their own frames of reference and their own value systems and realize that maybe some of the esteem they get from society and the status they get because it is a pronatal society is because they, they haven't even they just have to have the kid and they're already ticked a box do you know what I mean because we are so pronatalist um so I do I do um I do think that we're, we could be perceived as a threat but just through ignorance once it's discussed I think then it, it all becomes quite clear that we aren't a threat at all we're just exactly the same we're just humans yeah like you say the tick box of as a parent yeah it sort of encompasses everything but as a parent you can lose your identity when we can recognize that and understand that we lost our identity that we thought we'd have so we've had to work on finding who we are because our future didn't work out that way was they perhaps don't look at that until 20 years after having the children go and think actually who am I because I lost myself was we've already come to that point and moved on so yeah Jessica or Annie have you got any thoughts on this I thought you put that brilliantly Hillary I I, I couldn't I don't want to follow it you forget <laughs> what I'm thinking <gasps> I think I would maybe draw a distinction between the kind of uh, the the very vocal pronatalists, and I'm talking about um, usually white male conservative Christians who are all over Twitter saying that childless people, by which they really mean child-free people, but um, that you know that we're we're basically worth less and that we are not contributing to society and if you're a woman in particular you're empty and all of those horrible things that we hear um, I I'm really happy to be a threat to those people um, and I know that I know that they really they're really talking about people who are child free by choice but they kind of take us down as well by association um, in terms of just ordinary people ordinary people who are parents um I guess maybe maybe we are are kind of a threat to their comfort zone but I would I guess I would much rather take an approach of bringing them in and being friendly and um doing things subtly I don't know that works that works better for me so I, I just think for ordinary people who are who are parents we're probably not a threat it's it's like Hillary said it's ignorance about who we are and what our experience is and the fact that I think often sorry because I know we're running out of time I think often parents framework for thinking about childless people is to think about what their life was like before they had children and so we're they see us as kind of stuck there at perpetually age 21 <laughs> having this living it up you know um and and I think that's the that's the message we have to get is that whatever experience we go through as childless people, that's also transformational in the way that having children is transformational. So I think I would, yeah, I would rather move towards the position of mutual understanding than, than, a, than to be a threat, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think the way forward that we need to work on, like you say, is actually to speak to people, to get them un to understand us a little bit without being threatening, without being aggressive. And it's hard to do that. But when you go in on the attack, then you're automatically going to put up walls and make more barriers that aren't going to be broken down. 
and it's trying to find ways to have the conversations as and when you can, when you feel comfortable to do it, to sort of say, actually, this is the reality of what you've just posed as being a completely different scenario. It's not like that. But yeah, it's slow and steady, but I think it's speeding up. As I said, over the last few years, I think there's a lot more of us talking out. And I really would like to carry on talking for ages with all three of you. It's been a fantastic conversation, but sadly, I do have to bring it to an end. So... Annie, Jessica, Hilary, I want to thank you so much for all of your thoughts over the last thank hour. Thank you for having us. It's thank been you. Fantastic. It's, been, it's been fantastic to talk to you and hopefully going forward we'll have much more conversations and perhaps we'll have different viewpoints on what has changed because there could be some positives. That's what we're going to have for. Yeah. So yeah, thank you once again for coming and see you all again soon, hopefully. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. <laughs>